Hi, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here today. Great to see everyone. You know, it's really a tremendous privilege and honor even though we don't think about it every day, to get together to worship God. On, the creator of the universe, God who has existed forever, yeah. eternity, something that we cannot comprehend. Because for us, everything has to have a beginning. Yeah. If not an end, it has to have a beginning, does it not? Yeah. Well, today we're going to study out what God's message is for us I'm going to talk about a topic today that even though it's mentioned so many times from the beginning of the Bible until the very end, we don't talk about it much. And I believe we do not talk about it much because it's a topic that is abused so often in the religious world. And that's a topic of grace. You know, many people preach that you're saved by grace, so there's really absolutely nothing that you need to do. And the way you are is just fine. However, that is not grace. You know, there are two words that are very similar to each other, yet they have a slightly different meaning, and I'm referring to the words mercy and grace. What is the difference? Well, basically... Mercy means not getting what you deserve. And grace means getting what you do not deserve. You know, if a judge gives you mercy, that means you're supposed to be punished, but you're not. That's mercy. Grace means that you're getting something positive that you do not deserve to get. The word grace, I counted it last night, appears in the New Testament 81 times, if I count it correctly. The word repent appears 79 times. So in the Bible, there's more talk about grace then repentance. But we talk much more about you've got to repent than God's grace. Now we've got to talk about both of them. But I believe we need to be a little bit more thinking and giving thought and be more focused on the grace of God because the grace of God is what God is all about. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 18 where we're going to look at the heart of God. The title of today's message is The Grace That Saves and Shapes. Saves and Shapes. Because in the Bible, being saved goes together with being shaped. Ezekiel 18, verse 23. Everyone with me? Yes. Well, let's go for it then. The Bible says here, Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather... Am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? So what does God say here? Do I love it when wicked, evil people perish? No. Much rather. No matter how wicked they've been, I'd rather that they change their lives, repent. So they can be with me. That's the heart of God. That needs to be our heart. Should it not? Now, in theory, we know this needs to be our hearts. In practice, it can be a little bit more challenging. Is that not so? It reminds me when uh, uh, this must have been now eight years ago. Marie and I, we decided instead of paying rent, we're going to try to build our, or rather have someone build our house for us. 
so we can pay a mortgage and have something that belongs to us instead of paying someone else's mortgage every month. Wow. Well, we went to this guy to build the house for us. And that's one of the worst decisions I made in my life. But I'll spare the details. But this guy was a major crook. He ripped us off. It became a nightmare. And we took him to court. And, you know, going to court itself is a nightmare when you get the lawyer's bill. Isn't it not? Or the solicitor. Any solicitors here? No hard feelings. I know you studied really hard, so you deserve your pay. <laughs> Amen, Wayne. You helped me a lot, too. I appreciate that. <laughs> but, you know, um, after some decisions were made, and he had to pay us back for some things. Now, just because the judge says it, doesn't mean the common man does it. It's not always like that, unfortunately. So I remember having a conversation with this guy, and I said, with my graceful heart, if you take me to hell, I'm going to take you with me. If you make my life miserable, I'm going to make sure yours is too. Oh, oh, you sure do, yes. <laughs> Not exactly what you would say, a heart full of grace. Yeah, but we all have situations where it's just really challenging to love people. It's just really challenging to believe in them and to be like, wow, I really hope I see him in heaven. <laughs> can relate, huh? Sometimes more like, boy, I can't wait for judgment day to come for him. <laughs> We've all been there. Yet God's heart is, I don't care what you've done. I want you to change so you can be with me. You see, God, he feels for us. He hurts for us. God rejoices over us. All the emotions we go through with people, God goes through them for us. We don't see it. We don't feel it, but God is going through it for us. You know, before we talk more about grace, because indeed grace is one of those topics where, you know, it's like what came first, the chicken or the egg? It's one of those questions that really have not been answered yet. If you don't believe in God, but if you believe in God, the answer is simple. What first was God? And whether God created a chicken or the egg, well, that's not relative anymore. But first, I want us to talk about what grace is not. Because this is important, because I don't want us to get confused about grace and what is being preached out there about grace. We need to be clear on that. Amen? Let's go to Jude. And I'm going to trick you here. I'm going to test you. I'm not going to give you the chapter. I'm not going to give you the verses. Jude, verse 3 and 4. But being the Bible scholar that you are, I know you know how to find it. (laughs) Ah, yummy knows it. No chapter. Amen, bro. I know you're a leader now. (laughs) Jude, verse 3 and 4. Though you already, uh, sorry, up. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. And who are the saints? All of us are. If you're a disciple, you're a saint. You do not have to be nominated by the Pope to be a saint. If you live God's life, you are a saint. Now, I wouldn't suggest you go in the street, oh, I'm a saint. Do you want to come to church with me? It won't sound very relatable, but know in your heart, if you're righteous, you're a saint. For a certain man whose condemnation was written about long ago, have 
have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Amen. This is what grace is not. Right. It is not an excuse to do what you want to do and be like, God loves me. Yeah. That's not grace. About it. Yes, God will love you, but having a relationship are two different things. Yep. Now, grace is not a reason for us to want to live the way we want to live. Grace is not a license for immorality, for deceit, for not seeking first the kingdom. For being selfish, for being timid. That's not grace. Grace is something completely different. Now it's very sad that I know of men that I really respected and admired. That did great things for God. Had an impact. Changed lives. And when you hear them preach now, grace is being used as an excuse to justify not seeking first the kingdom, to justify not loving people enough to share the gospel with them, rather than using grace as something to motivate us to do what we've never done before. And when we go down that path where grace becomes an excuse, we're in trouble. Because then the Bible says, Man whose condemnation has been written about long time ago. Now who wants to be in that category? (laughs) Absolutely no one. We have a conviction about that. So let's make sure this morning that when it comes to grace, we understand it and apply it to our lives the way God wants us to apply it to our lives. Amen? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. You know, I'm reminded of uh, something that happened some time ago. Even before uh, we started building this house, even before I was married, she did like me. By the grace of God. But we weren't married yet. Actually, maybe she didn't even like me yet. I was still too tall, doesn't know how to dress, wears holy jeans. Uh, you, you won't know it now, but even though I'm white, I kind of had an afro bar high my hair was. You know, when I, when I went back to Jamaica as a married man, um, one of the sisters there to Maria, I never thought you could ever tame that hair of his. <laughs> but getting married, she was able to tame my hair. Going to have a haircut in time had a lot to do with that. <laughs> but there was one particular lady whom Maria was studying the Bible with. And she was religious. She was living with a man she had built a family with. The only problem was she wasn't married. And, you know, anyone can become a disciple. Like the Bible says, God wants everyone to change. But to become part of God's kingdom, you got to make some changes. you got to be motivated by God's grace. You know, I don't remember exactly what she studied, but for sure the Word, uh, maybe seeking God, the cross, discipleship, all of that. And she was fired up. She was excited. She loved Maria. She even loved me. Now you know how fired up she was. (laughs) But then we got to the point where she had to do light and darkness. And the issue came up that, hey, you know, the way your, your living situation is not pleasing in God's eyes. And that's where she completely turned. Because that was her God. She was not willing to change that. So she stopped studying. She stopped coming to church. 
And not too long after that, I moved, and I moved in the street where she lived. And one day I was in the yard. I was planting watermelons. And, uh, yeah, I, I can do that. I mean, you know, it takes a lot of talent to water those things every day, but I, I did it, and the watermelons actually grew. I'm very proud of myself. But she saw me, and I could see her coming to me, calling me, and she came. You could see her spear with, like, with a vengeance. With, like, finally, I've got him. And she came to me, and she said, You know what? I am a part of a church. I got a membership card. In spite of everything that you guys told me. And she was upset. And, you know, being as graceful as I try to be, I didn't react. But in my heart, I said, you just wait. The day will come. And we'll see what the score is. Yeah, I needed to uh, have some more grace there. But, you know, the, the really sad thing is that not long after that, she was diagnosed with cancer. And she passed away. And of course, then, thank goodness, my heart changed. And I felt, I felt really bad for her. But grace is so important, not only to motivate us, but for us to be free from, from hatred, yeah. from bitterness. Because all the things, they just hold us captive. You know, believe it or not, if you hate someone, if you cannot forgive someone, do you think that person loses sleep over it at night? Right. You think that person is like, oh, I can't sleep because John just hates me so much and he won't forgive me. Hey, that person is sleeping like a baby. And you are being tormented, you have stress, you have adrenaline. Your heart is being eaten away by it. God just wants to set us free. You know, grace and forgiveness makes us people that are free. Instead of living in bitterness. Isaiah 26.10. Let's look at the heart of God about grace. Though grace is shown to the wicked, they do not learn Righteousness. So what is the purpose of grace? Well, you can, you, can, you can take it out of this verse. Though grace is shown to the wicked, they do not learn righteousness. So grace is here to teach us, to motivate us to change. You know, I remember getting grace from my dad a couple of times for things I did. Or things I did not do. Like not doing my homework. Great going downhill. Actually, they were so far down, they couldn't go much farther downhill. But going a little bit more downhill. And my dad saying, you know what? And, I, you know, he asked me to come in the room and I was ready for the worst. I was ready. I was parting myself up, you know, making sure I could withstand the thunder and lightning and hurricane about to come my way. And to my great surprise... He just said, haven't been doing your homework, huh? So, well, make sure you do it. And I won't tell your mom about your grades. And I was like, Whew. And obviously my dad did that in the hope that this grace would motivate me to be different. And that's exactly what God does for us. We can be wicked, we can have done everything, but God is willing to give us grace not to continue in sin, but to say, well, I have got to change. Grace does three things for us. 
It gives us another opportunity. Isn't it great to have grace to be forgiven? Yes. Have you ever been forgiven? Yes, yes. Didn't you feel awesome? Yes. Relieved? Yes. Even feel butterflies in your chest? Yes. Being forgiven is a great thing. Given an opportunity is flat out awesome. Grace serves to motivate us out of gratitude. And grace serves for us to find comfort. You know, a car, any one of us have a car here? Who has a car? If you have a car, you know that there are two ways you can move the car. From the inside, which is the advisable way to move it, but you can also move it from the outside. It will move even though it's not very advisable unless you want to lose weight. But it won't really help you to get to where you want to go. Well, that is grace. Grace is the engine that will help us to get where we need to get, which is God. However, if we're trying to get to God without grace, it's like pushing that car, which will be tiresome. It will take a lot of time. It will be super uncomfortable and most of all, super discouraging. If you haven't tried, go ahead. Make my day. But you know, it would be really silly to say, one day, when you come to church with your car, man, I am so awesome. I am so strong. I moved that car from Edgeware all the way to Chalk Farm on my own. Ah! (laughs) That would be so silly, wouldn't it? Well, how did you do that? Well, I put in the key. I turn on the car. I press the gas and turn the steering wheel. That would be absurd. Well, the same with grace. If grace motivates us, it's not because we are so awesome or we're doing so much that we're saved. We're just being powered by grace. That's exactly what grace is. Now, is MJ here? Oh, no, she's in L.A., right? Well, I'm happy about that because I want to share something that happened with uh, our brother Yummy and myself. Ah, Yummy. But we're going to speak the truth in love. Last week, Tuesday, Yummy and I went to a pool hall where we went to play pool and... As we were playing, I thought to myself, you know, if I beat Yummy, that would make a great sermon. (laughs) But being the graceful person that I am, I said, bro, you know what? You know, what we can do is whoever wins today can mention it in front of the church. Not because I was winning. I said, I'm going to extend some grace to my brother Yummy. I said, bro, I, so I told him that, you know, I was thinking about using this as part of my sermon on Sunday. I said, but you know what? Let's start over. Let's put it at zero, zero. And we start. And then whoever wins, I have to preach about it. And I said, no, 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 no. Let's say, let's leave the score the way it is. <laughs> See, I wanted to give him some grace. But he wanted to make it on his own effort. <laughs> Bro, I'm glad MJ's not here for you, man. <laughs> so we decided to leave the score as it is, and we'll just go up to nine, whoever wins nine games first instead of five. And you know, this, this is really not relevant at all, and I won't dwell on it, but the week before that, I also beat Yummy, and so... Um, <laughs> And uh, Ayo was there also, so we have a witness. But we won't dwell on that because that's a different topic altogether. But see, Yami didn't take the grace extended to him. And because he did not, he lost. 
And because he did not, he's being discipled right now by all of us. Oh! But luckily, Paul is not a matter of salvation. It's just a matter of humiliation. <laughs> I love Yomi. It's been great spending time with him and building a friendship. <laughs> and now I just set myself up completely because the next time he beats me, I'm going to get it. So uh, maybe we should change sports. But anyway, we can talk about it afterwards. <laughs> but, you know, grace is the engine that moves us. And you say, yeah, but motivation does not last forever. Correctly, motivation does not last forever. Neither does a bath. <laughs> a bath only lasts for a day. Whoa. And during the summer, not even that. <laughs> but does that mean that taking a bath is useless? <laughs> oh, it only, you, it only helps you for a day. It's a big waste of water. Forget it. <laughs> I don't smell myself anyway. <laughs> I don't care what people think about me. Let them smell. <laughs> of course not. The same with grace. You know, grace, when we look, remember you got baptized, how fired up and excited and awesome you felt? Because the grace of God was working in you. But the motivation, we have to work on keeping that motivation. That's why we've got quiet times. When we read the Bible, we pray to God. That's why we have people that disciple us. That help us out. That's why we pray. That's why we take the communion. Not just to do it, but it's really a time where we try to motivate ourselves at the beginning of the week to have a right week as time, as time goes on. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 12. So grace is absolutely the motivator. Now let's look at and see how much grace God has given us. You want to see that? Yes. All right. Let's look at that. Zechariah chapter 12. All right. One of those, uh, if you're a new disciple, you hate these minor prophets because they're the hardest ones to find. But Zechariah is in the Bible. And unlike Judaism, I will give you the chapter. Chapter 12, verse 10. It's a prophecy here that applies to all of us. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. So God here is saying the day will come when I will not let my grace trickle down. I will pour it out. It will be available for everyone. Amen. You know, if you took a bath this morning and you left the, and you left the water running, when you get home, you will have poured out water on your apartment, on your neighbors, on everyone, and your water bill. It will be obvious, it will be noticeable. You cannot hide it. Well, the grace is poured in my little heart. Well, I can feel, but you cannot see. No, grace doesn't work like that. You know, I remember in Jamaica, I was in a supermarket, and this was some time ago. How long ago? I didn't even know Maria yet. I was completely hopeless. I was just there and, you know, hoping God would have grace to send a woman that could love someone like me. And, you know, I was just, I was just struggling. I was just doing my best. I was just there with all the other single brothers, you know, just hoping and praying and wishing and, and fasting in between meals for a wife. <laughs> in that supermarket that's how often I fast but I was there in that supermarket 
And I overheard a conversation between two adults, and one of the adults had his son next to him. Must have, this boy must have been seven or eight. Now he's a grown man. And I don't know what they were talking about, but there's something the father said that just really hit me. At one point, the father said, I don't know why he cannot just be like his brother. And I saw the hurt on the boy's face. And I felt for him. And maybe some of us have always been compared to our sibling in a negative way. And you know how much it hurts. It stings. And you will scar there for the rest of your life. However, grace is not like that. With grace, we don't have to compare ourselves to other people. Can you imagine God going, I just don't know why Nick Giorgio cannot be like Jesus. <laughs> well, that's the correct answer. <laughs> just don't know why Yami cannot play pool like Michael. Oh, <laughs> All right, enough about that. I'm sounding really prideful here. But you know, grace just makes us grateful. Grace makes us who we are. Can make us feel confident that as long as we are sincere and we really want to, and we really give our best, do our all, we're not perfect where we find comfort in grace. It makes us happy, it makes us joyful. Imagine that you're a person who's completely in debt because you have squandered your money living way above your means. You, you spend money going to hotels you shouldn't even have been looking at. <laughs> Buying clothes that you should not even have touched. Having more shoes than Emil de Marcos. <laughs> going to parties of the rich and famous and you are the poor and unknown. <laughs> but you borrowed money, you lived life, you went for it, and now you're in complete debt. You have to hide in your house because everyone is looking for you. And you're fired up about spam mail because the only other mail you get are bills and reminders. And you know you deserve what is coming to you. And now someone comes to you, a really wealthy and rich guy, and you know he's a man of his worth. He gives you a blank check oh. with a signature on it. And he says, you just fill in the amount and cash it at the bank. Yes. You make sure you take out enough to pay your debt, to have enough money so you can live off the rest of your life of the interest. Completely unexpected. How are you going to feel walking to that bank? How are you going to feel walking out of that bank? That can relate. We have to talk later, bro. <laughs> How do you feel walking out of that bank? You think you can hide it? Do you think people won't notice something different about you? You know, someone can come up to you, someone you've owed money who's been after you forever, we're just dreaming of putting you in jail, putting you away for the rest of your life. And he comes up, he says, I hate you. I despise you. You stand for everything I hate. You're going to be like, I feel so awesome. You hear what he said? Thank you so much. Life is good. <laughs> because you've been given grace. It should be noticeable to everyone. That is how the grace of God needs to be in our lives. And this is confirmed by 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And let's look at what grace and the relationship of grace to gratitude. And of course, there's one person that talks a lot about grace. That's Paul. 
as a matter of fact, um, if you don't understand the topic, well, the Bible can really seem like it's, it contradicts itself. Because in some places it talks about grace and not being saved by works. And in other places, like for example, James, it talks about faith without deeds is dead. Well, it's really, if you put them together, unless you think the Bible contradicts itself, is that grace inspires us to have works. Grace makes us grateful, makes us different, makes us change, makes us do God's will. And if we're not doing God's will, it indicates that we have no appreciation for the grace. And if we don't have any appreciation for the grace, we do not have grace. That's what the Bible teaches. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 13. Let's have a look there. You guys with me? All right. Let's see if I'm with myself here. Okay. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. What does grace have to do with us? Make us so grateful that it is overflowing. Not just, thank you very much. That was very kind of you. No, it will overflow. When Maria and I just started dating, her mom came down to Curacao to see who this big Dutch guy was that she decided to get involved with. And so she came down and she came down with a, a shirt. Now, in many ways, the Latin culture and the Dutch cultures are completely opposite. You know, the Latin culture is very expressive. You know, just talkative and, 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 and very colorful. The Dutch culture is very unexpressive. <laughs> It's very straight to the point. It's very unemotional. And so I grew up in, uh, to a great degree, in a Dutch culture. And Maria grew up in a Latino culture. So her mom came down with a shirt. And, and that day we decided we were going to go to the beach. And some disciples went with us. And her mom showed me this shirt. And in my grateful Dutch way, I said, oh, thank you. Very nice. And that was it. So at the beach, Maria comes to me, you know, I could see from far away she's like struggling in her heart. And I was like, uh-oh, what did I do? And she comes to me and she says, did you thank my mom for the shirt? I said, yes, I did. She said, you didn't thank her. So now I'm getting a little attitude here because I know I thanked her. And now she's saying I didn't thank her. I said, okay, well, let me be graceful here because, you know, she's Maria's mom. And so I went over to her again at the beach and I said, thank you. And this time I was really expressive in my mind. Thank you very much for the shirt. She added the very much in there, which was absent before. And so an hour later, Maria comes to me again, this time more angry. And she said, I can't believe you didn't thank my mom for the shirt. I was like, this is it. I'm not going to take this abuse anymore. I had it up to here. So I was really struggling, but after the emotions settled down, I went in and I realized, oh, yeah, it must be this cultural thing. Because in the Latin culture, wow, what an awesome shirt. Oh, it looks so nice. It looks so beautiful. <laughs> you know, and you show it off. And that is gratitude. And I'm not used to that at all. And so I realized, and I learned something about cultures right there. But my gratitude was not overflowing. And with God's grace, your gratitude needs to be overflowing obvious to everyone and obvious 
to God. So let me ask all of us this morning, is your grace overflowing? Or is it hidden so deep in your heart that even you have a hard time finding it sometimes? And that's why, that basically means losing your first love. Losing your gratitude. Your gratitude of, for God's grace not overflowing, but being on the inside, hidden from yourself, from everyone else, and especially from God. You know, grace needs to reflect in our discipling. Now, I believe as we want to do our best forgotten, that is flat out awesome. That is to be commended, is it not? Yeah. Disciples that sacrifice, that push themselves, that want to be everything they need to be for God. And we need to be like that. Yeah. But I think sometimes in our zeal to want to do as much as possible, to be as much as we can be for God, we forget there is grace. And this can reflect in our discipling relationships with the people we disciple. You disciple someone on something, and you see him coming from afar, and you're like, How do you think he feels walking to you for his discipling time? Or if you're a sister, oh, she comes again, I can't believe this. Instead of the person coming to you, and this is how it should be, just feeling fired up, they can get together with you because they know it's going to be an awesome time. Yes, they may be challenged, but it is going to be great, and they leave refreshed. They leave ready to conquer the world for God. You know, even when someone has to be discipled on something that's a, maybe a, a tough issue to deal with for them, it should always be that even though you may have to get a little hard line there, that they know you believe in them. That even in their darkest hour, they know that you believe there is light at the end of the tunnel. That would be awesome. Now, maybe you're not discipling anyone and you're only being discipled by somebody. He's like, bro, that's exactly what I was thinking. My disciple, mm, mm, mm. this message is for him, inspired by God. Because I prayed about it, finally. <laughs> you know, you as someone who's being discipled also has a role and making your disciple feel like that. And not making it a burden, but making sure your gratitude is overflowing. Because by God's grace, you have someone in your life to talk to, to seek advice from, to encourage you, to spur you on, who believes in you. It will make it a lot easier for your discipler if they know, you know, I'm appreciated. He really appreciates the time we spend together. She really appreciates appreciates the time we spend together. And we're all messed up. We're, none of us are perfect. It's just such a great person. I'm so grateful. God put her in my life. We have to help each other out. We have to have grace with one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And finally, let's look at the final effect that grace has on our lives. Let's look at the effect it had on the life of a man who truly was wicked. But against all the odds, was changed and became someone that no one could even imagine before. And that is, of course, Saul, whose name later became Paul. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, 
Paul writes the following. Well, let's start in verse 9, actually. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So what made Paul the man that he was? Grace of God. Not his talents. Not his background, his education, his salary, his income, his bank account, the house, the mansion he lived in, the cars he had, nothing of that. The grace of God made him who he was. And because of that, we have so many letters in the Bible that encourage us, that inspires us. You know, I was thinking about this. It's really amazing because the book of Hebrews was written to who? Jewish disciples. And were they doing awesome in their faith? <laughs> Absolutely not. They were at the point of falling away. So the author of Hebrews, no one is really sure who the author is or was, but most people would say probably Paul wrote this letter there were a group of people that were really weak, struggling, stinking it up, as we would say. But this letter that was written to them who were doing really bad serves to encourage us who live 2,000 years later. The grace of God. Paul was in prison. In prison for several years. Now, you know, back then there was no European Commission on Human Rights. And says Rome fell on the Europe, they had to obey by these human rights. That was still a long way from coming. Prisons were not what they are now. And Paul was in there for years, and I could imagine myself, Paul in prison thinking, why am I in jail? It is useless. I can do nothing. I cannot preach the word. I cannot impact people's lives. God, do you know what you're doing? Is your grace still with me? But being in prison, he wrote these letters that we now desperately need for our relationship with God. See, God's grace through Paul in prison, even though many maybe did not understand, was with us. Already thinking how to build people up that were not even born yet. There were many generations away, two millennia away. All of this by God's grace. Maybe you're studying the Bible. And... Like myself, you're looking at the challenges and you're like, man, this is so hard. <laughs> this is so challenging. And yes, it is. We cannot lie about that. Now, I remember when I was studying the Bible, when I studied the cross. Because before that, being called to be a disciple, to change my life, was, oh man, this is really hard. And if I don't do it, man, God is going to crush me and go to hell. Jesus, don't come back yet. But when I studied the cross, I literally on the inside, I, I can't really explain it accurately, but I felt like I was being torn apart physically. One side of me saying, this is really God loving you. It's a challenge, but don't ignore God's grace. And the other side is saying, forget about it. You're fine the way you are. Why do you want to start fighting your family and have your friends think you've gone crazy? Forget about it. But God's grace and his mercy was starting to mold my heart. 
and change it. So if you are studying the Bible, I do want to encourage you to think of God's grace and God's love for you. And that will help you to overcome whatever obstacles you have. There was a trek and field star one day and he had broken a wreck and he asked him, How were you able to jump so high? And he said, well, that's really pretty easy. I just throw my heart on the other side and my body will follow. (laughs) And that's what we've got to do. We've got to throw our heart to the other side with God's grace and the rest will follow. Thank you.